How are you all doing? It's episode eight of the Football Pod here. I've got Paddy Andrews with me. I've got James O'Donoghue here. How are you both doing, boys? Any crack? All good in the hood. James O'Donoghue, how is the head? <laughs> You're making me out to be an awful drinker on this podcast. Mm. <laughs> what are you? Big bloody Tuesdays or Wednesdays. Like. Yeah. Mondays, Tuesdays, <laughs> I always rattled on a Monday. It was only a one day stack for me this time. It was all right. Okay. Okay. Thanks for the heads up. I, I told you in plenty of time. I bloody was in Kerry when you told me. I was like, where's where's <laughs> where's James? I'm waiting for James here. Like, and James like, oh, geez, you I'm were, not going now. I'll you were you one of those fellas who was queuing to get into the stand at about one o'clock and the That's game on at half seven. I was in the stadium. It was the earliest I was ever in the game that I haven't been working at. I was in the stadium at half six and it was full. I got the last two seats. Myself and Chief got the last two seats in the stand. Not covered, by the way. Torrential mm. rain, but it was it was a great game to be at. It was brilliant. You were Some, by the pavilion, were you? Um, just yeah. underneath, yeah, 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 just there, and uh, right at the corner. And I felt I don't know. I'd say it's the same steward. I've first time in Austin Sack Park in Tralee, but I well believe it's the same steward who's always done it. Uh, he was ma- man in the gate, and he had to deal with all the Mayo fans coming up to him saying, "Why on earth would you have a bloody game here if you can't have us all in seats and sheltered?" The poor Mayo people who had driven all the way down to support their team. And this fellow no, was shipping all abuse. Shipping out, those Mayo fans. He was shipping abuse all game long. It did not phase him one bit. And he stood there all day long in the rain watching it. So fair play. I should have got his name. But uh, We had a roof on and we, we took it down Saturday afternoon. When you heard they were coming. <laughs> but the terrace is the best place to be in a match anyway. Yeah, it is really, isn't it? I think standing is way better. Mm. No, I do. I do agree. I do agree with that. Paddy, where would you, you be? Couldn't, you don't agree because you were in the seated. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to stand I, my, that my sort of way. I wouldn't hold up on the terrace. Like, I wouldn't last 20 minutes. I have a dodgy oh, back. Were you not a man for the hill? Yeah, well, about 20 years ago. Yeah. When I was 15 or 16, it was a lot different now. No, no. Posh seats for the lads. Like, and a couple of free sambos, nice cup of tea, cup of coffee. <laughs> like, like the setup we had there in Newbridge. Uh, yes. A couple of weeks ago, Tommy, yeah. Yeah. Nice and sheltered, nice bird's eye view of the pitch. I think uh, it depends never... on the day, lads. Yeah, it depends on the day. You know, a nice sunny day in Killarney overlooking the mountains. I'd stand in that terrace all day long. Yeah, yeah, Same yeah. in Navin. I'd stand all day long. But when it's a rotten day like that, you've got to be smart about it. The worst thing then is someone in front of you brings an umbrella and you can't see a thing. Well, yeah. well that should never happen. But I tell you what was a lifesaver. Having the umbrella open and covering the, the trousers. That was that was the way it worked. But the, the I haven't thought about that. The front obscure and everyone else's view, and I wonder the Mayo fans were giving out. No, no, I was right at the <laughs> front. With two brollies there in the front row, like no one could see it. <laughs> we're actually, actually, I, I find ourselves on on the on the footage <laughs> yeah, after the game, the <laughs> watching the game back. Matty Ruan second half point. I'll give a. I won't give a prize to anyone, but you can spot us in in that shot. Uh, I've got my mouth open watching Matty Ruan shot, so that Wait, shows you how good it was. His second half point. Yeah. We well, were down the by the. Front. You were down by the Mitchell's end. I haven't a clue what, what side is which, to be honest with you. They won't come out on the sideline there. Good score yeah, there. quality yeah. score. I enjoyed the game. James, what did you make of it? I, I was disappointed with the game, to be honest. Like, it was a cagey, nervy affair. Yeah. I didn't think it was going to be like that. But I think the reasons were probably the weather stopped the teams playing the, the way they wanted to play. Mm. and Mayo did something very clever, I thought, in the first five or ten minutes. They tried to kill the game. Like, they killed the intensity of the game. They killed all the energy around the stadium, I'd say, just by kind of minding the ball and doing nothing stupid early on. And I think that Kerry wanted to come out all guns blazing and get the crowd behind them, and it's a Saturday night in Tralee, and Mayo just completely punctured that atmosphere That's by just minding the ball and kind of doing nothing. I Actually, do you know what? It reminded me of... Um, Graham Souness was doing a Sky Punditry and he said when he was over in, in Istanbul, he was managing, was it Galatasaray he was managing, wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, he said that when they played away games, like the intensity of the crowd and everything would be so insane that you'd have to have these tactics just kill the crowd for five or ten minutes just so you could get, your, get a, a hold of the game. So they used to just pump it into the corner for a throw-in. They kind of delayed the, the throw-in, waste a bit of time. Everyone push up keep them in the corner for a few minutes until the crowd calmed down. Like it's actually it's actually very clever, but 
Mayo might have done it by accident at the we- at the weekend, but it definitely that, worked for them. They just that, took a bit off the crowd. That's interesting because I had a different perception watching it. I thought that Kerry had set up very defensively to try and counteract what we saw Mayo do against Dublin early on when they kicked him. And I wasn't sure, was it the weather or was it the way that Kerry had set up to, to kind of get Mayo on the counter? But it's interesting you're looking at it from that regard that you thought the Mayo were maybe trying to kill, kill the game and the atmosphere a little bit because the atmosphere in the second half was electric, lads. Like, it was great in that last 10 minutes when Mayo were on the run, but it was it, it was a slow burner, that game. But in, in previous years, Mayo would have come out fighting. Do you know, like, there'd have, been, there'd have been four fellas on the ground rolling around even before the ball was thrown up. So they went at it with a completely different approach. That's just why I noticed it, because whenever we used to play Mayo, we'd be thinking, right, first five or ten here, this is going to be mental. Mm. And it just didn't go that way. And I thought it was a change of approach by Mayo. And if, if, if they did do it on purpose, it, it was clever, I thought. That's interesting. Paddy, would you have killed the momentum in Tralee going down on a wet, blustery night? Maybe like, I don't know, was it wet in 2019 in uh, that great game? It was always, yeah. The, I think we had a draw one year and then Kerry beat us another year. And probably not. No, we, we, we didn't. We would have kind of backed ourselves to come out and be able to play and, and kind of take control of the game normally on the front foot. But it didn't really work. And it's funny you say that, James. I wouldn't have thought of it in that regard, but in those games where, where we were a loss to carry, it was the crowd were really involved in it. And it was all, it was exactly like you're saying, it was rolling around, uh, lots of rails all over the pitch. And for us as an experienced team, we would have looked back and said, maybe we didn't control that or manage that as well as we could have. And the crowd definitely got involved in it. So you're right. It's not really something to associate with Mayo. They're, they are one of the most passionate teams <laughs> you know they, a lot of their players would wear as shrewd as I suppose James Horan comes across the players would wear their hearts on their sleeve the supporters definitely do so for them to kind of manage the game um, yeah maybe it was something that, that they were trying out I agree with James I, I thought it was um, it was cagey enough and again it's kind of like conditions was really hard going again which, yeah. which didn't help from what we've seen, we've seen five games in the National League now. I, I, I think those two teams have shown they're probably the two best teams in Division 1 to date. Um, I think that's fair to say. I know Armagh got back to winning ways uh, with a good win against Kildare on Saturday night again. Tough conditions for them, but I think you can see on form what we've seen to date in 2022. Kerry and, and Mayo look to be the informed teams at the minute. So you're hoping for a bit of a shootout. Conditions didn't really allow to that and, and it was a bit cagey. Potentially, the way things are going, you could be looking at a league final with those two guys in April, early April in Crow Park. That might be slightly different, and you'd look forward to that. Um, but look, for Kerry, it's a win. They've dogged it out again. Jack O'Connor's going to be happy with that. But bear in mind, we look four or five weeks ago, a sloppy start in Newbridge in National League with a draw, a game they easily could have lost, and they've improved steadily since that. Clifford kicks the score at the end. Mayo will be frustrated with that. Obviously, Lee Keegan has the opportunity. But, but for Kerry, it's another win. But I don't think Mayo will be overly disappointed with that game. They're still no. well, well, well in control of getting to a, a league final. And it would be nice to see them in Crow Park in early April in, in a game and yeah. get a good sense of things. I'll see you on the hill that day, James. If that's the league <laughs> final. All right. Three of us on the hill. That'll be, that'll be a good one. And a nice I, day. I'm not going for that. No chance. Fairweather fans. Paddy, you won't go to that, will you? Only if the dubs are there. Um, so we're going to get back to that game itself in a, in a little bit more depth in a little while. We're going to run through the results. We're going to be talking about a couple of games in Division 2 and a few games in Division 4. Um, there's one place, though, that I think we have to start in this conversation that developed over the weekend. I'll be honest, I actually had absolutely no idea that there was an issue going on. Actually, I'd heard about it, but I didn't know it was that big a deal until Saturday evening when the Mayo PRO uh, I had a chat with him and he said there's actually no media interviews happening today and I went what? Why? I wasn't working so I didn't really care but he said they were doing it in solidarity with the fact that the players expenses weren't being paid um, now the sense was that was going to happen across the country a few managers went rogue <laughs> Jack O'Connor turns out actually went and did a, an interview immediately after that game um, the Porrick Joyce was out doing an interview uh, a few other Andy McAtee spoke to the media but he said that you know they were supporting the the, the players um, and the issue that was at hand. So just before we get into it, and I'd love to hear from the two of you how you both went about claiming expenses and how it actually works. 
Um, we'll get into that in a minute. I'm going to explain the issue at hand in case some people don't get it because it was covered briefly on, on League Sunday. If you haven't heard Tom Parsons on Off the Ball yet, he's, he's on with Joe Malloy for about 20, 25 minutes. That's well worth checking out in the OTB GA feed. If that's where you listen to the football pod, you'll get it. It's a podcast just before this one. It should be in the OTB GA feed. And actually, Donal O'Neill, one of the founding members of the GPA back in 2001, is going to be on OTB AM later this morning. So if you're one of the, the, the hardcore football pod fans who listen on a Tuesday at 6 o'clock in the morning, Donal O'Neill is coming up at 8 o'clock, and that's going to be well worth listening to. Um, so just to explain the player expenses problem that we have at the minute. Back in 2020, and you both can you know, confirm this for me because you were both there, the players... Intercounty footballers and hurlers agreed to a new players charter with the GEA where their expenses will be cut because of the global pandemic. And it was done so under the premise that when things went back to normal, the expenses will be restored back to the normal level that they were before the pandemic. I think that's natural enough. It's happened in plenty of businesses across the, the, the world. As we know, a lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people took pay cuts. And, um, you know, I, I think across the board, most of that has been restored to, to where it should be, depending on the industry they're in. So, Initially, it was cut to 50 cents to the mile and training was capped at three sessions per week. Now, both of those ultimately were cost-saving measures. First problem that kicks in is that the GA seemingly go back in their word last year and wouldn't restore it back to the 65 cents to the mile, which they had agreed to do once things went back to normal. An impasse ensued until about last week when the GA actually have now gone back and restored it to 65 cents to the mile, but they will only do so for four sessions per week. So. A lot of people listening will be like, oh, but sure, it's not fair enough. Shouldn't it be four sessions per week? That's a separate conversation that we might get into a little later here, or I'm happy to get to another day. I think it's something that's well worth exploring, the amount of sessions, the amount of time that a player is with an intercounty squad. I think it's a separate conversation that shouldn't be muddled into this one. The simple fact is there was an agreement in 2019. A cut was brought in because of the pandemic. And now that agreement hasn't been restored, even though it was said that it would be. So in the last couple of weeks, we've learned that the GA made a surplus of 13.5 million in 2021 for various reasons. Um, we do know there's also financial issues at play in, in, in the association. But bottom line, players shouldn't have to pay to play at inter-county level. And that is what's happening. There hasn't been expenses paid in some counties for up to four months. So you're talking about 30, 30% of GA players are students at the minute, intercounty GA players, 30% are graduates that are probably just starting jobs. So that's 60%. Or probably most of them could be renting in Dublin, insanely high rents. They could be one and a half to 2K out over the last four months alone. So this is where the issue is. The GA have agreed to go back to the 65 cent per mile, but the GPA don't want it capped because that wasn't in the original agreement back in the day. From my reading of it, the GPA are happy to go back and have a conversation about capping sessions again. But if you start capping sessions, Paddy and James, I'll put it to you this way. If you start capping sessions and to say, right, if you do five sessions per week, you've got to claim it off your county board. I would imagine that Dublin County Board, Kerry County Board, Mayo County Board, Galway County Board, even the Mead County Board might have no problem because bigger county, bigger resources, much stronger financial arm, bigger sponsorships they'll be able to make up the costs and make sure their players don't have to pay to play. But if you start looking at hurling, hurling squads in the, in the lower tier, or you look at county squads in Division 4, Division 3, smaller counties by nature, um, smaller funds available to them at the county board might have different priorities in terms of hurling or uh, underage structures. They're not going to be able to afford the same amount of money that a Dublin or a Kerry or a Mayo or a Galway can afford. So immediately there's going to be an issue here with the elite becoming stronger and the rest of the players losing out because they're not from a different county. So I, I just don't think that can work by capping it at four sessions per week and allowing the county board to pick up the expense. So the other issue is that the GA will also only allow expenses for the first 32 players in the panel. So any extra players, new kids, new fellas in the block, um, players trying to break in, they can't claim any expenses. We'll, we'll stick on this one quickly, Paddy, but I presume in Dublin, if you're having A versus B games, you've got to have 30 players for a start. But a squad, an intercounty squad, is surely more than 32 players. What if there's injuries? Sigerson, I, I, I don't think it's specific to Dublin. I would say every county in all four divisions of football is carrying more than 32 players this time of year. Uh, exactly the reasons you said. Colleges, football, injuries, and guys getting opportunities. Managers mm. trying to look at players. There is no squad in the four divisions that has 32 or less players at the minute. Now, when we get into championship, 
even still, it would be more than that. I'd say teams will carry 35 or 36. Um, but if a guy has trained from before January, really, teams are back training in December, trains for, say, five months up until April, and then is cut from the panel, he still is, is the argument there that he shouldn't get anything, that he's trained for five months and he's not in the top 32. He's trained every bit as much and as hard as the other players who have made the final 32 players in the squad, but because he's maybe not as talented that the, the coach or the county board turn around and go, sorry, mate, you're not getting anything for five months. So I, I don't agree. It's not just a Dublin thing. I think the 30, if a guy is in a squad and he's training away, and I thought Tom Parsons was absolutely black and white on League Sunday last night. This is not a complex issue, I feel. And his argument is spot on. Players are not looking for some Machiavellian crafty way of trying to get a few quid extra out of it. If you are going training, whether it's the gym, whether it's your, your training sessions, whether it's traveling to games, all you are looking for is that you are not out of pocket. You're not looking to make money on it, but you, it should not cost you to represent your county. Colin Rourke was on some, maybe a controversial um, <laughs> contrarian approach last night saying, look, sure, they should they have the privilege of playing. They should just kind of get on with it. I, maybe a bit of tongue in cheek from, from Colin Rourke there. What do you think of that? Sunday night, everyone's watching. Colin Rourke, a man with, what, 50 years, with 30, 40 years talking to people. What do you think of someone like that having that to say? I didn't agree with it at all. Um, and I know I've seen stronger reactions from people. The idea that sure, look, it's just a privilege, they should get on with it. And uh, what about the club players? 80,000 people aren't going watching club games, and the GA are in charge of 50 or 60 quid uh, for people to go and watch those club games. And bear in mind, the same county players, they go back and play with the clubs after this as well. So I don't think that argument stacks up either. And Tom Parsons, I thought, dealt with it quite well. It, it would have been easy to get annoyed uh, with such a kind of narrow-minded view. But in my opinion, it's, it's a straightforward issue here. Players should not be out of pocket. They're not looking to make money. They're not looking to be shortchanged if we train four or five times a week. And again, nearly every county probably is between gym sessions, recovery sessions, training and games at this time of year. And a match. A match is a session. And, and matches that you are covered for that. And that's it. it. It really is that simple. And you can get muddled waters here and try and put in layers and shadow boxing and, and different opinions from people. The bottom line is, is if you're traveling to games or you're in an inter-county squad, whether you're in the top 32 players in the squad or you're one of the seven or eight extra players at the minute, you should not be out of pocket for going to represent your county. Yes, I agree with work that it is a privilege and it's a great honor and the opportunity to represent your county in Crow Park, but you still so your expenses should be covered for that period of time. And um, so, yeah, I, I think it's an easy, maybe I think it should be an easy fix between the GAA and the GPA. And um, the t- players have made their their stance pretty clear over the weekend, uh, and, and obviously look. Jack O'Connor maybe stepped out, part of Joyce, these type of things, that, that's fine. The players themselves have said this, and I agree with them, and I agree with Tom Parsons um, and how he portrayed it uh, yesterday evening. It seems like a simple issue, James. Like the, the players had an agreement. Like you signed that charter back in 2020, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And pretty simple. Like everyone collectively understood that, you know, we'll, we'll take a cut here, but it'll be restored back to what it was at. 100%. And Paddy's bang on. But the trust is going to be broken over things like this. Like you sign that and you know then that, look, when everything is back, we'll go back to the previous arrangement. Perfect. Everyone got on with it. No one knew that there was going to be this issue arising two years later where they tried to undercut the players. But it doesn't matter about how much they want to change it or anything like that. I'm shocked that the, that the GA are going after the players in this. Like, the players are, are the part of the GA that is most profitable to them. They can make the most money out of them. They put on this great show. They give up their lives. They a- attract the crowd. Then there's things like League Sunday or the Sunday game or this show where we analyze them. You know, we were in their lives. And then they want to take a couple of pounds off them for no reason. I just think that it, it 
it's just a bad look for the GA when they should be looking after these players, rewarding them for giving us this unbelievable spectacle. And instead, what they're doing is taking every euro they can. But you know what, James? It's not, it's not even it's not even rewarding the players. That, that's and that was yeah, a, that an was argument. Yeah, I know what you mean. The lads are making a few. It's literally just covering their costs. Like, nobody is looking to make money on this. It's not players beating a drum saying we want to make a few quid. And, and semi-professional was mentioned. And uh, I thought O'Rourke the, the tone of of the angle where he was going at. And look, it was a pretty sharp piece, so it's difficult to get your your clarity around your argument in, in such a short space of time, but. It's not players looking to be rewarded. It's literally, if I'm going out paying petrol and, and looking at, at guys like you're saying, Tommy, students and guys like that, traveling from Dublin to wherever, huge mileage. You, it's just cover my costs. I'm not mm. looking to make money on it. I'm not looking to be rewarded. I'm just not looking to be out of pocket. Yeah, I think that's that's well, that's it. And it's the message that's gone out, James, is echoing what you're saying. Players just don't want to pay to play. And it's it's yeah. what's happening. And it's it obviously... I. I my sense of it is players are very frustrated by this. They're very frustrated, but like, it's not like they've been out crying and whinging about it or anything like that. They've been frustrated. And I think they have to take a stand. Like you have to take a strong stand. If there was an agreement in place, it yeah. needs to be honored. Like, but I can say I was involved with Kerry for say 2010 to 12 years. Say, right. Mm. We did not have one conversation about expenses ever. Like it really? was never a thing. It was never a thing, but that's Kerry. Like you would have, of course, you have other counties then who aren't treated maybe as well as the bigger counties players, which is which is unfortunate because realistically, as we heard about Mead, their players' expenses are all paid up to date. Kerry's are, Dublin's are, Tyrone's are. But it's the other counties that have to have to bang on with fundraising all the time, all the time. And then they're being undercut with this. So you'd have serious sympathy for them. And like I think a lot of a lot of players involved in say the bigger teams wouldn't actually realize what's going on in the other counties until you speak to some of those players. Mm. But what will be interesting is will the players stick together on this? Like will all the bigger teams players come together with the ones who have less profile? Like because when Tom Parsons said that they are going to stick at this and go for more more of a, a hands-on kind mm. of. I don't know what the term is, but they're well, going to go at it properly. Like, how, how, how is that going to work? How are they possibly going to get all the players together to go at it to possibly, what, boycott a match? Like, players not speaking to the media, let's call it spade a spade, most players aren't going to say, give a huge amount of insight or say too much in the middle of a season anyway. It's not, it's not really the, the platform for it straight after a match. You might get a nice bit of reaction or something like that. They weren't doing it to punish journalists. It was a symbolic message yeah. that we want this sorted now Joe Malloy questioned Tom Parsons tonight on it and said are you going to strike like would the players strike Tom wouldn't be drawn on it now that's not to say that it won't happen he it said that there will be conversations on Wednesday and Thursday well, you never know maybe it won't happen about something like this but like if the players are being undercut with something so simple like to me looking on it is such a simple issue there was an agreement there in 2019 you said you go back to it why aren't you going back to it it's so mm. simple. Go back to it. And if you want to have a look then at cap and sessions, or you think that the intercounty beast has gotten too big, then have a look at it. Like from, from my understanding, it's an online system that you upload your expenses into. So the GEA can actually see, okay, County X is training five times a week. County Y <laughs> is training seven times a week. Do you know what I mean? So they can actually monitor it. And if they were thinking that, you know, County X is training five times a week, two are a recovery session, one's in the gym, whatever, one's on the pitch, or maybe one's a video analysis session, whatever it is, or else another county's training five times a week. And you think after looking at, you know, sports science or whatever, that there's a player welfare issue going on in this county, and that's the problem. Well, then send a player welfare manager down and say there's an issue in this county. Stop training, flogging your players five days a week. Like, it's a simple thing. There are different issues. Sort them out separately. Pay the expenses. Get that sorted, first of all. Yeah, but you touched on it there. It's naive by the GA to think the teams are only going to train three or four times a week. Have you seen some of the stuff that's going on on the field? The, the quality, mm. the athleticism, yeah. the spectacle. And they want to drain every last drop out of these players. And then when they ask for anything, it's a no. Do you know what? We'll renege on that. Like, I think that some of these fellas in the suits needs to go down and spend some time in these county setups and see how much 
work is being done, how much time is being given, and then to turn around and try and take things off off the off the setups, I think is just it's disrespectful to the to the crowd that are the most important, which is the players. Yeah, and as I said, there's players in some counties that have not been paid their expenses, not paid money, but just given their expenses to cover the costs of making it the training for the last four months. So that's students or you know young graduates who are one and a half to two k on average out of pocket. Refunded, Tommy. Not refunded. Paid. Sorry, refunded. that is the language. Is their important. hands in their pocket, young lads traveling around the country for the last three months. The crowds at all of the national league games over the last eight weeks has been spectacular. Mm. I'd say that the crowds going at the games in the most horrendous conditions has never been as high after the pandemic. Yes. People appreciated GAA through the pandemic when players were playing behind closed doors. And there was a real sense of appreciation for how big an organization and how much entertainment, how brilliant the intercounty game is during a really tough time. Crowds have flock, flocked back to that now that they've been able to. Players are looking to be refunded for the cost they have incurred mm. to produce that entertainment and put their own lives on hold. Yes, it, it, it's an honor and a privilege, and I get all that. That is a massive reason why we do this when you grow up as a kid. But I do not think it's acceptable that any player in any county should be losing money to represent his county, his or her county, whatever it is. I, yeah. I just don't think it's right. I think what Tom Parsons and GP are asking for is 100% legitimate and fair. I think it's an easy fix. Common sense should prevail here, and it should not go down the road of, of strikes and players missing games. But if there's no give and take over the next couple of days, um, people are going to be put in hard positions and hard decisions mm-hmm. are going to be made. Um, and it shouldn't get to that. Yeah, it, it, it is very simple. I think what we saw with some of the, the Sunday columnists, some of the people speaking on the Sunday game, some of the you know people have spoken out about it. With the GPA, it's always complicated. It, you know, with any union, it's complicated. But with the GPA, there's always a degree of suspicion. The GPA are there to look after the two and a half thousand intercounty players on the island. Like that's who they're there to look after. Maybe it's a little bit more now since the merger, but they're not there to look after the club player. They're not there to look after managers. They're not there to look after coaches, media, or anything else. It's the intercounty players. So. Um, I always think that there's a bit of uh, needle that's always going on that's a bit needless and complicating situations like yeah. this GPA. I, I think GPA have certain questions to answer over the last decade. Maybe there's been issues that they haven't properly dealt with. But with this in particular, it's so simple. It just needs to be sorted out. And just to note as well, like uh, the GA putting it back on the county boards, and I know I've said already, that's all well and good in the counties where things are motoring well. But we all know that some county boards just don't have the the the... The brain depth, you know, the same resources at, at hand, the same people working in the same place that are able to, to, to run a business the way that, you know, county boards need to be run right away, like at the minute. They also don't have the same numbers, like the amount of people, like you're going back to the same people every year trying to fundraise, like in Leash or County, like say Sligo, you're asking the same people every year to put their hands in the pocket to fund the county team. And especially now when we say that the, the season's been shorter, Paddy, right? We're saying the season's been shortened. Yeah. But like for a Talchin Cup team who possibly would have been knocked out in a qualifier in June, if they get to a Talchin Cup final now, their week has been extended to 18, 18 weeks of the year, 30 weeks of the year. Like. So actually counties now are going to have to pay more if it's been put back in that. So I'm not sure the GA have thought about that as well. Or maybe they have. Uh, final one on this, James. I must say, one, yeah, the GPA do savage work for the players. Like, if you ask for anything at the GPA yeah. and you give them your phone number, God help us, they will ring you 5,000 times. <laughs> <laughs> or they they'll will, text you. They'll yeah, text you. They will, a lot of texts. They will go above and beyond for you. But I don't you know what I was just thinking was, say the GA were giving out about fellas looking to go to Australia and mm. McShane, your Mullins, your Cliffords, and they're saying, why do these fellas want to go away to play in Australia or whatever. And then That's back cool. here, they won't even give him 50 cent petrol money to go train. <laughs> like, Nail on the head, Jimmy. Nail on the head. Yeah, like that, they just do not respect the players enough. If they're going to be, we're, we're judging them at the highest level. They're up there on a pedestal. They're giving their lives and then we're just taking it. We're, we're taking it from them from a different angle. It's just not fair. 
last one on this, James. How easy is it to claim expenses? Like, is it annoying? Is it a is it a big issue? Like, was it a thing that you had to do every week? You had to sit down and claim your expenses, or how did you go about it? We went about it twice a year, but now to be fair, my expenses were always fairly low because. I was claiming from the middle of town in Clarny up to Fitzgerald Stadium. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, 200 meter walk. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was driving a four liter. Um... <laughs> oh, my dog. I was cycling up. I was literally just. Um, I was. Uh... You claimed expenses for cycling. <laughs> no, I'm always joking. I used to cycle. <laughs> I actually cycled up to a game, a National League game, Kerry against Dublin in 20. 20- 11 i'd say really yeah did you did you play i did oh maybe 2012 actually where was it clarity was... we played this in clarity in, in 11 and 13 and where 11. did we play in 11 and 12 i'll check 11 here it was um i can't remember i remember it was so, you, so you cycled you cycled up to there so you'd be close you'd be close to the stadium like I'd be close. Yeah, yeah, but you'd I obviously have. I rarely you'd had. Have, I rarely had that working. many expenses. You'd be working out of Clarny, or you could be working in a different part of the county, or you could be traveling the matches and stuff. Yeah. Um. So, Paddy, you would have had the same crack. You've been what? A couple of miles. Yeah. You never would have had the, the biggest commute. Were, we're fortunate. We're generally lads are yeah. coming from the city center out to DCU or from home here, Castle Lock, out to Inner Fields or DCU, wherever we were training. So, uh, we used to do it on a monthly basis. Uh. You put in where you're traveling from, where you're traveling to, the sessions that you did, and and that was it, and it was calculated. So that was it. Um, not overly complicated. Um, mm. Yeah, it's a, well, like it's a straight for anyone who who works profession professionally as well. That there's expenses with that. You put in your spreadsheet or wherever it is, your copy or receipts to your financial controller or CFO, whoever it is. It's this is every day. Like, this is not a complex thing. This is what I spent out of my own pocket. Can I be reimbursed for that? Can I be refunded for that? That's it. Um, and it's it's gotten to a stage now where it's getting this coverage. Looks bad. Nobody's coming out of this mm. happy. People are getting frustrated. Yeah. You're getting differing opinions on social media, on TV, and through different media outlets. I think Tom Parsons and nail in the head last night representing the GPA. Players yeah. just do not want to be out of pocket. Simple as that. Let's get it sorted and let's move on and let's start focusing back on the football. And hopefully by the time episode nine of the football pod comes out next Tuesday, it's been sorted. Hopefully it has, because it is a simple thing and it should be sorted. Don't know, just before we finish, 2010, you played yeah. in Killarney. You come off the bench, Dublin bet you by two points. I don't know, was it that day or was it 2013 when you kicked the point, you started left corner forward? Who was the left it? corner it's forward it's that point. day? I was cycling up. I was cycling up through the the town, and it was all dubs, and they they pushed me off the bike. <laughs> <laughs> it was Philly McMahon, wasn't it? <laughs> well, it must have been twenty thirteen because there would have been no dubs at a game in twenty ten before they won that All Ireland, would there? Oh, all both of them, if I recall. You hammered them. You hammered them in thirteen. You must have been playing that day, Paddy. Were you? Oh, it was electric. Thank you. Uh, yeah. There we go. They were. You were going very well that day. We were yeah. way off it. We were we were way off it. Yeah, we lost our first four or five that that league. Thirteen. Yeah. Yeah, you were yeah, hammered, yeah. hammered by Mayo, hammered by Mayo, beaten by seven yeah. points, beaten by Dublin by ten points, beaten by Kildare by four points, beaten by Donegal <laughs> by nine points. Then you bet down in round five, and you bet Cork in round six. So you must have yeah, that year. And Tyrone, or oh, we drew with Tyrone last day up in Oma. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. There stayed, you go. Up, stayed up on point difference. Okay. You got good expenses for that one. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So hopefully, look, hopefully it's sorted. And uh, if you want to listen to any more about, about that, I'm recommending the Donald O'Neill chat that is on Tuesdays, OTP AM at 8 AM. Donald is always a fascinating character to listen to. One of the founding members of the GPA back in the day. Not involved in any capacity anymore, but always somebody we like to check in on. So, Episode 8 of the Football Pod, lads. We're going to get talking a little bit of football now over the next wee while. Um, I'll run through some of the results, if you don't mind, briefly, before we we move on to some of the featured games that we're going to look at. In Division 1 this weekend, Armagh won 12, Kildare 10 points. I think we expected that to happen. Um, Armagh back on track. Kildare are going to need another result to stay up. 
Kerry on Saturday night bet Mayo by a point. Paddy, you were saying that you're not convinced that Mayo will be too disheartened by that game. I think they both got no. what they wanted out of it, a good competitive match. Jack O'Connor in particular spoke about Kerry wanted to play a game with their backs against the wall, and they certainly got that in the last 15, 20 minutes. And then on Sunday, Monaghan, brilliant away win against Donegal. We'll come back to Monaghan in a wee while. One twelve to 10 points against Donegal. Donegal and Bally Buffet. We saw Michael Murphy come off the bench, which was a big boost for them, but another flat performance from them um, in Division 1. And then the Dubs back on track. 13 points to eight against Tyrone. In particular, that first half was so impressive when they went nine points clear. They had eight different scores from play. The whole makeup of the team looked better, Paddy, and we'll come back to that in a couple of minutes when we get talking Dublin. Down in Division 2, down, lost by a point to Offaly. Down, we're in control of that game with a couple of minutes to go, and Offaly pulled it out of the fire and uh, kicked a late winner. A massive, massive win for them in the battle to stay up. They're still up against it in the last couple of games. Um, Mead then, massive win against Cork, 118 to 110 in Division 2. It's Tuesday, let's face it, nobody's coming here for the results, but I'm going to roll through them anyway. But, uh, and then Derry and Roscommon drew 12 points apiece. We might come back to the Mead game in a few minutes. I'm allowed to talk about Mead this week, thankfully. And then Galway held off Clare, 2-8 to 1-5. So Galway are now the only team in the country with a 100% record so far in um in the National Football League because Cavan ended up losing in Division 4. So, and Derry ended up drawn. So in Division 3... Derry would have was... won only for McGuigan being sent off. Yeah. Because he would have yeah. kicked... shovels, wasn't it? He was a joke. Straight. It was a joke. He, I was, a he was raging that as well. He was devastated. Threw the gloves off. <laughs> he, was, he was raging. And to be fair, he would have kicked it. Like... He would have yeah. did again. He was like, last kick it again. Gale Force win behind you. That was a gimme for him. Yeah. And they missed it. And like that, who took it? Emma Bradley was it? If they win that, that more or less I would have felt would have kept them ahead because the Rossi still have to play golf. They don't think they beat golf. Like it, it still keeps them. Their nose is just ahead of Ross Common. But if mm. they'd have won it, and just to wait to win it with the last kick of the game in Hyde Park, it would have been a big win for Derry. Yeah, and he would have kicked it. And it's like he did that. Like he was pulled down by the defender. But like, what can he do there? But, uh, but like, McGuigan's, the McGuigan's on the so the linesman comes in and says, book the boat. It's just like, it's a cop out. Like, he's saying it like Lazy. the same but, thing with Clifford against Throne a couple of years yeah. ago. He's been wrestled to the ground and the, the referees, the easy thing, oh, just book both of them. Just book the boat. This logically. There you have the ball attacking. Is Shane McGuigan, their best forward or sharpest shooter, going to turn around and fail the defender? Why? <laughs> like, just common sense, like. That's the thing. The, the 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 two yellow cards. I'd like to say given two yellow cards for a schmozzle is a 1980s thing, but I'm not even sure there was yellow cards in the 80s. So it must be a, a 90s thing or a mid 2000s thing, as you said, Paddy, Just good. just use common they're sense. Both, they're both boat lads. Just common sense. That's it. Yeah. His first yellow kicked was an absolute disgrace as well. He was. You see his first yellow card. Yeah. It was barely a foul, and he got booked for it. Yeah. Oh, I felt sorry for him. No, in fairness. Yeah. That would have been a savage win away. Away in that promotion game. Did you feel sorry for Potty Hampsey, Paddy? No, I didn't. Um, no, I didn't. Put your Dublin hat on there, will you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't at all. I didn't feel sorry now. Michael McKernan was probably touching go now with his thing on Fenton as well. Um, so no, I didn't. Ill-disciplined lads can't be rewarded. Was, was someone close. someone must have been kneeling behind Costello when he got the shoulder? <laughs> <laughs> Did Costello make the most of that? Hmm. Yeah, I'd have to look back at that again. No, no, he was. So how do you think? Right? Uh, I don't think Morris Day had seen it, did he? The, the I don't think he did. Hamsey's got a yellow because it's off the pitch. It's kind of on the concrete behind the fence. It's a little bit dangerous, but look, like if that's on the grass there. Yeah, it's nothing. Can I put it to you this way though? What was Hampsey supposed to do? Hold on there, Cormac. You go first after you. Yeah. He was always going to give him some bit of a tip going past him. Yeah. What uh, the argument is, right? He's got a black card. Uh, I'll tell you, I remember the of a black two years card. ago in Oma, the last game before Sorry, lockdown. Howard Hampsey did do that actually. He was waiting for the double lads to come off the pitch to usher them down the tunnel. 
and then oh, yeah? up yeah. and a, a 30 man brawl. So Hamsey so was to blame for the brawl. Very polite at times when you need to let lads down the tunnel at, at times. So, um, but now look, was it? Did it deserve a yellow? Probably not. Really, it was the fact. A reason I think he's got it is because it's off the pitch. It's on the concrete. It could be a little bit more dangerous. Um, well, James, you were jumping in there on the black card. Like that's when you're on a black card. Yeah, and- he's he's after getting the definition of a black card. So as soon as you get that, the Dubs have kicked five on the trot. You're thinking, right? I'll keep my powder dry here for ten minutes anyway in the second half. <laughs> and first opportunity he gets, he gives mm. him a clatter. But I think Costello was clever. He saw him coming over, and he knew that he was going to get a tip. And he knew that he knew that he he was on a, already on a black, and he went down. I, to be honest, it probably was a red. It was a yellow because it was off the field. So, mm. do you know, he, yeah. No, I was just wondering, was there any sympathy there? But that's that's but interesting to hear about the tunnel back in the day. Mm. Yeah, what's that one back? You were you were looking on, weren't you, with McShane? I was. Yeah, I was injured. I think Hot McShane was injured. I remember, it was all kicking off, and the crowd were getting involved. And I was looking down, tanking me lucky stars. I wasn't in the mix. So I was at the back of the stand, keeping well away. And the girl, Colin McShane, dragging one leg behind him, trying to climb over into it. I was like, mate, get out of there. You, yeah. you need both legs. Going in there with one leg is not the answer. Yeah, um, yeah. But now, look, these things happen. Look, I think for Tyrone, for, for Hamps himself, obviously captain last year, amazing player for Tyrone. He'd be disappointed because the Armagh fallout, I think Tyrone as a whole, it's not been a good league for them. No. So far, the fallout where I thought they were probably a bit harshly treated with the Armagh game, I think that's to pick out from that brawl and four there guys get sent off. We touched on that a couple of weeks ago. Hamps he sent off again. He's going to be frustrated with that. Yeah, they are. Yeah. And like, you can, you can sense that. It was that. a frustration thing as well. Like, you're right. Mm. Like, the game wasn't going well for them. They were obviously, they were well down at half time. Um, and he just gets caught up in it. And, you give the referee a decision to make. You, you've got to look at look at yourself, I suppose. You're, you're on yeah. this. Uh, I think you know, Tom, actually, it was actually Cohen's so, you know, Tyrone's best period that third quarter, even though he gets sent off. Tyrone actually win the third quarter 4-0 and are going quite well. Kick um, some nice scores, yeah. He did, but I don't feel sorry for him now. We'll come back to Tyrone a little bit. I have a question about them when we get to the goal. Division three results just to finish this. Antrim 119, Longford 12 points. Big win for Antrim. We didn't even get oh, yeah. to mention the Corrigan Park issue, which we might come back to in a wee while too. Limerick 1-6, Westmead 112. Big win for Westmead away. Leash hammered Wicklow. Wicklow, um, who obviously lost their manager, Colin Kelly, since we were last talking. And they've had, uh, he stepped away um, due to work commitments. And they've had um, some of their selectors step up to the plate and, and got a new coaching ticket involved. And then for Mana. They lost to Loud. Loud went up to Fermanagh and bet them 2 12 14 points. I was listening to some of that game in LMFM. Very impressive win for Loud. Uh, so Mickey Hart's Loud are right in the mix for promotion. Well, They're on like seven points with Antrim. All position. The two teams from Division 4 that were promoted last year could yeah. be back to back to back to back promotions for, for Enda McGinley and Antrim and Mickey yeah. Hart and Loud, which would be very impressive. Phenomenal stuff. Derry obviously getting promoted from Division 3 are in a great position to get back-to-back promotions themselves as well. So there's brilliant work going on there in those counties, the momentum they have behind them. Yeah. And um, that would be brilliant for, for Ian the beginning, the job he's done there with Antrim. So. Yeah, yeah. Like, it looks like Longford and, and Wicklow are, in the, are consigned to relegation there unless Longford can drag Fermanagh back into their leash. Um, There's probably, Westmead and Limerick could probably still back themselves to, to try and yeah. make promotion there, Division 3. Division 4, Couple of interesting results here. Cavan were beaten by Tipperary, and looking at the fixtures ahead, Cavan and Tipperary. Even though there's five teams that can get promoted from Division Four, Cavan on eight points, Tipperary on seven. They have it in their own hands that they win both of their two remaining games. They're both playing London. I think one of them are playing Carlow, and one of them could be playing Wicklow or Wexford. Um, they will go up. To Division 3. So the, the two provincial champions of 2020 may get straight back up. It wasn't looking great for Tip for a while. Leitrim yeah. had a big win against um, Leitrim had a big win down in Carlo. Keep Burn. I heard through the grapevine, scored two sensational points from the sideline. So uh, 1-9 he kicked at the weekend. So he, he's motoring well. And Ryan O'Rourke scored 1-3. So when you're getting 2-12 from your two star forwards, it's not a bad return. Um, Wexford just held off water for 15 points to 14. Tip back Cavan, 111 to 17. 
Connor Sweeney, I believe, equaled the record for uh, the goal scoring record across the country, across the board. Himself and Killian O'Connor both have 39 goals in inter-county football, yeah. which is some feat. Incredible. Um, sensational. Paddy, you didn't end up on the list. I'm just outside. I'm 11th. You, well, actually, it's down to the top 40. James O'Donoghue is 18th. James, I don't know if you knew this, but you had 22 Two goals. training goals as well, is it? Includes <laughs> penalties. James scored four penalties. Penalties. Yeah. Give me. So, uh, surprised to see Peter Hart so high up on that list. Uh, he was a penal taker. I'd say a few of them were penalties, are they? 17 penalties. 18 from play. 17 so, penalties. Like Harry Kane. There you go. There you go. But So that was an interesting <laughs> 17. one. Yeah, 17. That's in league, league and championship. League, league and championship. Or league just and league. Championship. League, league, and championship. League. league and championship. League and championship. He scored a great penalty against us in 15. Yeah. He pressed your penalty, pinged it right into the bottom corner. It's class. Nice. Yeah, he's a yeah, good player. Yeah, for us, yeah, you know, you'd appreciate that. There are the results. Connor Sweeney is another top operator. Ah. He's been around, he's been around a while. Hmm. He was under 21 my age. They beat us in, in Tralee um, in on 21 final. Really? We beat Cork. In we what? In, in what? In, that's 08, 09? Yeah, no, yeah. twenty, yeah, two thousand ten. I'd say maybe nine or ten. Hey. And uh, himself, Quinlevin, I suppose. And no, few- Quinlevin was too young. I'd say was he? He's on that minor team that beat Kilkenny and Mannion and Jack's minor team in eleven. So I'd say you had Robbie Kiley yeah. in that twenty ten tip team in twenty one. Yeah, Connor Sweeney. He was brilliant. They came down to Tralee and beat us. We had, we had a very good team, and they nabbed us, and wow. they lost, and they got beaten. Tipperary won seven, Kerry won six. Oh, a classic. Classic. First of April, 2010. Wow. April Fool's Day there, all right. Yeah. There was six there you go. Paul Ganey, Barry John Kane on your team. Yeah. I had a shoulder and I got injured on the Tuesday night before it. Did you? We, you missed it. We did a box game. We said that we wanted to ramp up the intensity of the... I think it was the Thursday actually before the it was on a Saturday night, was it? Uh I don't know if it's Saturday now. We did a box see. game in there where you who had was, to get it. And you the had coach to who was the coach here? Throw him under the bus. I know it was more player driven uh drill. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jacko, was it? <laughs> no, no. It was oh no, I don't know who actually took the drill, but it was John Kennedy was our manager, but he wouldn't have taken the drill, not yeah, fair, yeah. it was yeah. um it was a box game and you had to you were to collect the ball at full pace and basically go down this tunnel of death and just get absolutely killed. <laughs> Two and nights Barry, before the game. Oh, yeah. Jesus. Barry John Walsh just, he was a big man at the time. He was a big man. Tommy's brother. Yeah. He just stood, stood me up and banged me a shoulder and I just pinged up my AC joint. Ah, love it. Up. Yeah, Gone. magic. Was that the start of your shoulder problems? Yeah. That was, oh, no, I dislocated the other one already by then. Right. That was some team he had. Yeah, Peter was- Crowley, Jonathan Lyne. That's hardly that's hardly Jonathan Buckley. Johnny Buckley, yeah. Johnny Buckley's hardly that it. Yeah. Is he? Yeah. Johnny Buckley, yeah. He'd be a year older. John- than Barry John Kane, Mikey Ganey, uh, Dahi Casey from Crokes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Barry John Walsh, Paul Ganey. And then that's- on the on the tip side, you had Robbie Kiley, Kieran McDonald, two quality defenders for years, Peter yeah. Ackerson. Um, Atchison was ooh. savage operator. Yeah, won the got away, Jimmy. Huh? Yeah, there you go. There you go. Patrick Murphy actually missed a penalty in the final to win it. Hit the crossbar, yeah. hit yeah. the crossbar, yeah. and it went back about 30 yards behind them after it hit the bar in the last minute. Murphy's penalty that day. Yeah, hit it that hard. And we played Donegal actually before that. We gave him a good tipping. That was Jim Gavin's Dublin. And Jim was Jim McGuinness the Donegal in 21 man result. Uh, Jim Gavin was definitely the Dublin coach. Was Jim against the Dublin guy? Feel like he was, yeah. Feel like it was Jim. a precursor to the decade we were to see. That yeah. was the start of it all for the Dubs. If only you'd have got the finger out, Jimmy, he's going to put it all to a halt. Yeah. How different it might have been. Wow. There's a sliding doors moment. Right. Okay. We're getting to our ad break in the football pod a little later than usual. You are listening to episode eight of the football pod with Paddy Anders and James Donahue. Paddy, don't worry. We have a couple of games to get through after this. And, uh, We'll be back right after this and we're going to lead it off with Kerry Mayo and Tralee. You are very welcome back to episode eight of the Football Pod with Paddy Andrews and James O'Donoghue. I'm Tommy Rooney. We're going to start off straight away here with Kerry Mayo and Tralee. I want to know, 
um, James, we mentioned, you mentioned earlier on the athleticism of some of these players that we're seeing in intercounty football at the minute. I was so impressed with Dara Moynihan at the weekend, I have to say. Um, I thought some of the Mayo players were really good in terms of Matty Ruan. I actually thought Aiden O'Shea had quite a powerful game for, for much of that match, even though he's getting a good bit of stick for the fouls late on. But Moynihan, the work rate that fella got through in that game, the power of him bursting down the line, very impressed with him. Um, yeah. What stood out to you then, apart from the setups that we'd mentioned earlier, a Mayo setup? There was, a, there was a lot in it, to be fair. Um, one thing that stood out to me was the matchups. You had some excellent battles. You were Tom Sullivan against Ryan O'Donoghue in the, in the Mayo forward line. I thought that was a great battle. Mm. You know, two similar physiques. I think that Ryan showed so hard all the time. One dirty ball, but didn't win any nice clean ball to be able to take Tom on. And uh, I thought Tom did very well to keep him out. Ryan still ended up, I think he ended up man the match. He kicked, a, kicked some lovely frees, but that was a great battle. And if, if that happens in Crow Park, they will, they'll seriously have a good tussle there, I think. Mm. Um, that's, but that's a great it one. was difficult for him because, for Ryan, I don't know who, because the kicking wasn't always on because the weather, they turned down a lot of kicks in, I think. And Kerry yeah. did get bodies back because Mayo were slow coming forward. And on yeah. the other side, Clifford and Oshin Mullen had a battle. That's an interesting yeah. one, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I think that Clifford has, has it on him. I think that Clifford has his number. And I think if I was James Horn, I'd be switching that matchup. I think you get more out of Mullen centre back. Are you saying on a Sean O'Shea? Yeah. Yeah. Who would put on the cliff? Keegan. Yeah, I think you have to have kind of a team approach on Clifford as well. I don't think no yeah. matter who that one man is. It, yeah. Is he going Indeed. to, it's not going to keep him to, to two or three points anyway. So, back to me, did a great job on him last year and he could still kick eight points. Yeah, the other exactly. in the like if he gets ball in hand, unless there's two fellas there, he'll probably score. Um, so I, if I was Mayo, I think that's something they can improve on. They can move Mullen out the field and mm. he can be he can be a driving force from there because okay. I think Ruan, Ruan was outstanding, yeah. And, and actually, really just good. on that, it felt like it felt like there was a lot of Mayo won a lot of midfield, a lot of the midfield battle. And I'm surprised by that because we have we've given the Kerry middle third a lot of kudos over the last while. You know, a lot of appreciation. But a lot of the Mayo midfield catches were uncontested. Like, tell me about Ruan's impressive it, performance. It wasn't just Ruan. It was the way... I thought Mayo were, were excellent on Kerry's kick-up. Okay. Which is not surprising because Mayo, it is a massive strength of theirs. Their preparation, how they set up. Um, they're, they're a smart team. Horn is around the block. He knows the crack. New mm. goalkeeper, obviously, in for Kerry. Um. And, and Mayo just control that section. And it's such an important aspect of the game. Uh, and it wasn't just like Ruan was, was, was Boston. It was the whole setup they had, forcing Kerry Long, the body positions, the starting points of the Mayo front six, their half-backs pushing up. They were controlling where Kerry were going to kick the ball. Um, so it wasn't just an outlandish individual display from a Mayo midfielder. It was the whole mm-hmm. setup they had. And that's what they're really good at. That's... They're a really, really smart team um, and the experience they have, and it gives them a massive platform. If you get on top in the middle, you get the opposition goalkeeper under pressure. It's it's so pivotal. Well, we, 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 we had talked up the Mayo midfield quite a bit, and rightfully so last year. Like We, we thought it was a 60-40 in the All-Ireland final. We yeah. thought that Ruan and Loftus would have the edge on Kilpatrick and Kennedy. Mm, I think that better. battle swang that final in a lot of ways. Yeah. Like Ruan Patrick, going forward, both James. Both the great game, yeah. Kick three, three gear points. Did you like him going yeah. forward? I think he did a bit of everything. No, I just wonder who was detailed to actually mark Ruan because, again, I'm only thinking towards the summer here and what both teams can do to improve. Mm. Ruan is now a top, top player. Yeah. I would be looking to put a defensive minded player stuck to Ruan and say, keep him quiet. It's one up for us. Jack the way Barry. that Jack Barry can do for Fenton. Yeah. yeah. Like, see, I don't know. Was Barry on um, Ruan on Saturday night? I was too busy they were trying kind to of, They were kind of dry. stepping off each other. Yeah. They were kind of stepping off each other. Whereas I think that's a detailed job. Mm. You start him out. Because he's like, too good at the moment. Yeah. Like, like the Fenton job. And, and Jack Barry, he did do do jobs in Fenton at times, but you could see that that was his focus, that that's what he was doing when he was out there. I think you're right. I think there was a bit of floating going around the midfield because there was some uncontested kickouts. 
Um, it's because it was so slow around the middle that it was so easy to drop off. Yeah, yeah. It kept yeah, dropping yeah. off, and the ball was just played sideways. It was it was a difficult okay. watch at times. Even the crowd, you could tell, were getting a bit bored. Like. There was a bit of that. Now the crowd it spices up in the second half when Mayo bring it yeah. bring it to carry Mayo chase that game, and I think actually that's when Aidan O'Shea started to come into his own a bit more. Um, I don't know what you thought of O'Shea's performance, Paddy. Uh, he's been coming off the bench a lot this year, and it felt like James Horn yeah. was potentially getting us ready for maybe a, a world later in the summer where Aiden O'Shea is the impact sub with 20 minutes to go. He started this game. He looked in great shape. I thought he had a good game around the middle. Yeah, and, and this is the thing. Aiden O'Shea is probably judged a bit differently for, for, from other players. He takes a lot of focus from casual observers, from supporters. And I think... And Andy would have touched on this. Andy would know him obviously better having played him for years and with the whole hullabaloo last year. Should he be potentially dropped for the final and things like that? He's a mm. massively important player for now. He doesn't do headline stuff. So he's not a guy where he does an obviously brilliant thing, like he scores three or four points from play. That's not Aiden O'Shea's game. He's not a scorer. He's brilliant at... He's actually funny enough. He's a really good tackler despite how he finished the game, which is which was the surprising thing. He's, he's an important player for them in terms of their transition up the pitch. He's normally, he very, very rarely would give the ball away. He draws the focus of opposing teams. They need a plan for him. It frees up space for other players. He does a lot of things that are really crucial to the team, which maybe are not overly obvious. And that's why people can look in casually at a Mayo game and go, Aidan O'Shea, he didn't, he didn't score a lot. He um, didn't assist a lot, but there's other parts of the game where he's really important. I thought he was. I thought he was good the other day. Um, That's an interesting juxtaposition. He's a player who makes headlines, but isn't a headline player. And I think that is actually summing up the problem here. He probably is. He's someone who stands out. When he came on the scene and he played yeah. inside for a couple of years. But he was he a different was player. Up he scores. was a different player, yeah. And he, he is a different player. And he's been on the scene. He's over 10 years. Yeah. Been. You can't yeah. expect him to be still doing those things as well. Yeah. The funny thing... Um, you might have seen Guardiola last week and kind of going off piece there a bit, but uh, Grealish was getting a lot of stick off the media. And the same thing, Guardiola was coming back with a similar idea to go, it's not, it's not just about stats or assists or goals. There's other things he does in the build-up on how the team operates that are unbelievably important to how we function as a team that don't grab the obvious headlines. And Aidan O'Shea, I think, in the role he's being asked to play by James Horan, is probably in that bracket a bit that he does a lot of stuff that's crucial for how they perform. I thought he was good the other day. Uh, like I said, the surprising bit was the fouls at the end. He'll be as frustrated as anyone about that because he is such... Normally, if he gets you in a tackle, he's he's turning you over. He, he's, he's hard to get away from. Probably a bit of fatigue at the end. Uh, it gives away that free and Clifford obviously kicks the winner. But he's still a massive player for me. There's no two ways about it. Yes, he can split opinions. But mm. if... And you're looking at if Mayor are successful this year and get over the line ultimately where they want to get to, he will have a massive role to play. In yeah. That. James, two very last quick ones on this one. I, you want to jump in on something so you can jump in on that as well. Two very quick ones. Tony Brosnan impressed me. So Jack Savage replaced Sean O'Shea at 11, kicked two points. Um, but Tony Brosnan stood out to me, obviously scored a goal, played a gorgeous pass at one stage from the far sideline to Clifford. Clifford actually kicked it wide, but it's a beautiful little ball that split the defence. He really impressed me. The second part of this question is, it still feels like Mayo are missing another scoring threat. Even though I, I've liked Aiden Norm so far, he scored a brilliant point in the second half. Yeah, they just, nice. for a good bowling, bowling kick three points from play, it still feels like they're missing a presence or something there. It does. That's interesting. That Paddy just on about Aiden, right? Mm. Where Mayo played Aiden Shea at 11, allowed Tyg Morley to sit in front of Ryan O'Donoghue and Arm. That's why if I was Mayo, I'd be playing nearly a Boland there on Morley or on that centre back option just to occupy them to take a bit of heat off Ryan Dunhu inside because Kerry were well able to drop men back because yeah. when Aiden Shea went deep, we could cheat back and make it hell for the boys to try and get a kick pass. So that's just one thing. I always, I never really know, maybe it's aerially why Mayo don't play Aiden Shea in midfield. Because he'll still do the same gig. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you can still... Centre forward is such an important position. Uh, you have to occupy that centre back. Because if that centre back is good enough, 
he'll cheat off you and he'll stop your full forward or corner forward from operating at his top or his best level as well. Mm. Um, but well, with, you, with you think, James, it, it would make sense if you're looking like Rowan is all action. He's the athleticism he has, the aerobic capacity to get up and down the pitch. Let him go and let Aiden kind of sit, be a presence at midfield for kickouts. Yeah, to and tackle. Put, put a block in and then he's sitting yeah. kind of from between the half back line and midfield. And he's clogging up that space. Colin Cavanagh, I know, had a fairly distinct role, but he Colin Cavanagh played midfield and dropped, do you know? And yeah, but that, Colin Cavanagh went all the way back nearly. Yeah, yeah. One. I don't think Aiden needs to go back that deep. No. I don't think that's Mayo's style or James Horan's style either. But you just think in terms of things he's maybe not as good at, I think he's a, a compliment to what Ruan will do. I think they kind of suit each other. Uh, there does seem to be a bit of a reluctance to play him around there. Yeah. Um, Felt like he I should have been there in the All-Ireland final match. Slide works with him because he's just he's not a scoring threat. You've seen. I'm thinking back to the All-Ireland semi-final last year. That first half where he was inside, a bit of a howler in front of goal. Um, yeah. He definitely he definitely isn't confident from the goal. Like he should have taken a shot or two in that game too. Um, at the weekend, yeah. he, he set so them off. So it'll be interesting to see where where they deploy him. Um, yeah. But, but you're right. Like again, you're looking if you're letting a half back and if you're not occupying defenders. If they're well organized and they're a smart team with smart coaches, they will block up your attacking game. You, you, you can't just be allowing a centre back or a half back easily just to, to drop off and clog up spaces. It's puts massive pressure on the inside line. Mm. And, and like I say, Mayo traditionally kind of struggle to get scores anyway. They did not kind of, they do, they, they, they do. struggle to in shootouts. So when you're asking Ryan, I don't know who to do that at the best of times. Then you're adding in a Morley and other guys dropping back and clogging up space. It's nearly impossible uh, for, for Mayo, so that they, they need to tweak that. But like I said, there are lessons they would have learned. Like, like said, James Horn knows this. Like, last word on Brosnan. Last word on Brosnan, James, and we'll move on to the next game. I want to get Paddy yeah, into those. I thought he was excellent. He compliments Clifford as well, I think, because Clifford seems to make a lot of movement for the kick pass. Yeah. And Coney kind of hovers around the edges then. And he's kind of looking to give Clifford that kick pass, like that beautiful pass you said in the top of the D, where he just he missed it, Clifford, but it was a great move where he just opened up the boot and just curled it into him. But Tony operates just around the outside. He'll get a, a little offload, and his feet are so fast that he can create a chance just like that out of nothing. Mm. And his goal was like that. He the just well got shoulder and great move. Him. Yeah, left Keegan slip. Gave it to Clifford, just continued his run. And then when he gets in those positions, he's a great point taker, but he has a goal in them as well. Okay. And uh, I thought, yeah, that, that was a nice finish. But just finally on Kerry. Kerry, we're missing Shawnee, right? I'm saying the importance of a number 11. Kerry's number 11 is probably the best in the business. Like That's going to be a huge addition for them. Also missing Ganey, mm-hmm. Paul Murphy, Gavin White, and Moran. Like, there's a lot of strength to come into Kerry. The Kerry people not usually try and play down there. Chances win the honor. Are you putting them in as red hot favorites here? What's no, the no, opposite? I'm, What's the opposite I'm of a Yera? I'm matching up. I'm matching up. Mayo. You're going off peace here, Jimmy. The lads are going to be on to you. Jacko's ringing you there in the background. <laughs> He's not in the WhatsApp group yet. Are you not in the, are you not in the WhatsApp group yet? No. <laughs> I think though that Mayo nearly came out of the weekend looking a bit better. Do you know they they were nearly saying? Yeah. Well, no. No. That probably is the consensus. Yeah. But what I'm saying is. Kerry have a bit of, bit of work to do, but they have a couple of top fellas to come back in. Okay. And that game, you, I was watching that game with a view to the summer. You were watching that game in Ventry, in Paddy O'Shea's. That's where you were watching that game. <laughs> he wasn't watching the game at with all. With a view <laughs> to the summer. You were 15 points deep. I watched what about, lads, you can't leave that without Fergal Ball of points in the first Beautiful. Half. Yeah. Oh, Outside, yeah. right? Tough conditions. Loved it. Loved everything about it. Yeah. yeah uh, but I think both teams be reasonably happy. Mayo, yeah. it's not the end of the world for them. There's I agree. A long course for into the a league final, perhaps. And Kerry winning a really tight game against one of their contenders for the All Ireland. Yes, there's mm. loads of improvements for both teams, but I don't think either of them and the stage of where they're at are going to be overly disappointed yeah. for Mayo losing or Kerry getting carried away with winning the game either. Let's go rapid fire through another couple of games, right? Um. Fifth place in Division 1, Donegal on five points. They can still be dragged into the relegation battle here. So Kerry, yeah. Armagh, Mayo are chasing that league final place. Kerry in nine points, Armagh on seven, Mayo on seven. Donegal are on five points. Monaghan, after beating them, are on four points. Kildare are on three points. 
Tyrone are on three points and the Dubs have finally won a match since last year's Leinster final. They're on two points. Paddy, you must have been a happy man. Yeah, it was their uh, Dublin's best performance of the year, obviously. Um, chalk and cheese from what we've seen in the first four games. Uh, and I don't think necessarily, you know, it was great to see the likes of James McCarthy and, and Al Merchant getting back for the first games of the season. I don't think it was a personnel thing. It was their energy across the pitch, their attitude on the ball and defensively as well was light years ahead of what we've seen over the first four weekends. There was purpose in everything they did. One of the, if you go back to the opening night of the National League, you thought defensively they were way too easy to play against. Our match was kickballs in and the full back line were completely isolated. I thought that was an improvement, even in Newbridge, that with Johnny Cooper and Mick Fitzsimons coming back. I thought they looked a hell of a lot more solid, albeit they didn't get the result in Newbridge. They carried that on and really shut down Tyrone. Like they could see it eight points. And now look, Tyrone were really poor, and, and we'll talk about that separately. But I thought defensively they looked a hell of a lot better, and that's just mm-hmm. the experience of well, Mick for Simons, David Cooper. Byrne, Johnny Cooper, John Small, Robin McDade, Robin Key Murphy's McDade. Key Murphy's the only newbie yeah. there. Like. But if, if you look as well, what those guys brought. Fitzsimons and Davy Byrne, I don't think I've ever seen either of them up the pitch as much. Fitz, he must have ran about 12k in that game. He was unreal. And the energy of going forward. And that is the way the game has gone now. You need hard runners off the shoulder. You need to be running with purpose. Robbie McDave kind of goes under the radar, but he's a massive guy to have back in there because he brings that. Yeah. And we were talking about Dublin being so passive on the ball. Their attacking game plan in the first couple of weeks in the National League was just... They were looking around waiting for these runners and there was no one coming. And they were completely stuck and they were losing the ball. They were turning it over. Whereas on, on Sunday, they had energy all over the pitch. Um, Fitzsimons, Davy Byrne carrying the ball. John Small as well, nearly gets, probably should score a goal. It's a bad pass by Cormac Costa in the second half. But that runners from deep with purpose, with energy, caused havoc for Tyrone. And then also, another part of their attacking game, kick passing the ball forward. Costello yeah. made a massive difference inside. Costello is brilliant at showing for the ball. Dean Rock, it kind of freed up space for Dino as well. Again, you're comparing it to the couple of weeks before in Newbridge, where it was just very static. Kieran Kilkenny was inside and he was winning ball and there was no one really coming off him. I thought the energy, the, the speed and the decisiveness in their attack and play was way better. 11 points to two up at half time. It was their best display. Second half was probably a little bit quieter. Third quarter, again, they won't be happy with. They mm-hmm. lose the third quarter, four points to nil. Yeah. And um, which they will look at. So it wasn't all sunshine and roses. Just but on yeah. a party, when you, you mentioned at the top that you don't think it was personnel, but I put it to you this way. The personnel that they did get back allowed the front six, the forwards to play as forward. Like you have Brian Howard, Bugler, yeah. two lads who are operating the half back line are now back in the half forward line. Scully, who Kicked a very, very, very impressive point. Well, Scully's Scully's been, year, yeah, a hundred percent. And then you've got your full forward line of Cormac Costello, Kieran Kilkenny, and Dean Rock. Mm. Obviously, Conor Callahan is still missing there, but it felt like a Dublin team, James, didn't it? It felt like the Dubs were were back. The Dubs mm-hmm. that we expect to see. Howard wing forward is a no brainer for me. I just think he is an outstanding wing forward. Whereas centre back, he just didn't look as comfortable for some reason. Mm. I think that the way that Dublin were set up at the back. Gave him a great platform. But the main thing that I took from, from Dublin, they went up there with an unbelievable mentality. I'd have loved to yeah. be a fly on the wall in some of their meetings because if you saw everything they did at the start of the game, they were fist pumping, they were celebrating. It was just championship kind of intensity they brought from the start. And you need it, especially when you're up against Tyrone there. But probably that's been a bit off with Dublin. Their intensity was just so much lower. It was kind of like, oh, yeah, it went over the bar. Let's get back in. It was just kind of, they were subdued or something over they the last couple of weeks. They were to everyone. And yeah. I was worried. I was in Newbridge at the game and we were looking at them coming off the pitch. And Kildare were obviously, it was a big win for Kildare and the place was, was rocking. And I was looking at the body language of Dublin players coming off. And, and, and their heads were down. It was a tough yeah. place for them to be. They'd lost four games. they just lost to another Leinster team. You could see confidence was so low. And it was like, there's a two-week gap here now to turn this around. And you could see it literally from the first whistle, the purpose in everything they did. It was everything that we'd questioned in the first four-day games today, where it was passive, where it was slow, where it was like nearly going through the motions. I'll give you an example, and it might have been as obvious for people looking in. Mick Fitzsimons gets a ball 
in the first quarter um, and Tyrone dropped the guys off. So he gets a, a hand pass off Evan Pumper and the space opens up in front of him. Now it's easy for someone to kind of look up and take a solo and kind of go on second or third gear there and no one would really notice it because there's loads of space in front of him and he's kind of pressing up. Fitzy, literally, as if there's someone right on his tail and there's not, sprints forward with the ball. Mm. He is going flat out into the space. And what that does, one, he's making ground quicker up the pitch, but that's a trigger for everyone else. That if, if he's going full tilt, then if I'm coming off his shoulder, I need to get up to full tilt. It sets a tone for everyone else. And Davy Byrne was brilliant at it as well. There's a clip in the first half where Myler tries to put a ball across, uh, kick pass across the, the square. Davy Byrne gets it. Quick kick pass up. Another kick pass inside. I think I have a note there. I'm not sure who finishes. Dublin get a score out. But within 10 seconds from Davy Byrne collecting the ball in his own square, Dublin get a score at the other end. And that yeah. was the speed of their attack, the purpose of their t- attack, was not there in the first four games. But you, things like that, you could just see changes. And that's a mentality. That is a mentality because it's easy for Fitzy to come out with that ball and just kind of canter up the pitch. And no one would say anything otherwise. But what it does, it sets, sends a message to the other players in the team. If I want to get on the end of this, I need to sprint with them. And they cut Tyrone open at will. They put massive pressure on the kickouts for Morgan. They totally shut down uh, Nine Morgan's kickouts. And you can see that's a mindset as well. Aggressive Johnny Cooper nearly gets in on goal after the yeah. Tom Costello ends up kicking the point. But that's someone in your half back line and he's winning it in the, the opposition D. That's a mentality. That's playing on the front foot. It's being aggressive. And again, it was chalk and cheese in that first half up in Oma from what we had seen in the four league games today from Dublin. And it's a mentality shift and a purpose in everything they did. And you t- hit the nail on the head, James, as well. A really good defensive structure. Good defense leads to good offense. If you're set there and you have a platform, that allows you to move the ball up the pitch quicker. And the, the same, if you've got offense and you're not giving the ball away, it leads to good defense because it allows you, the defender's time to get set as well. And Dublin were just far more cohesive than they have been in any game to date and in massive contrast to what we've seen from Tyrone, who kind of carried on their, their really poor second half from Bally Buffet a couple yeah. of weeks before. It's been a bad league campaign for Tyrone and, and that was that was a really poor performance from them as well. On that, James, um, relegation candidates, as you put it, on the first pod, <laughs> the All-Ireland champions, Tyrone kicked nine points the first. Now, Dublin have now got two points on the board. Tyrone have three. Um, they got a draw the first day against Monaghan. I'm just going to run through their scores. Nine points against Monaghan. They're beaten by Armar by six. They kicked 14 that day. Fair enough. Um, the next day out against Kildare, they win it. 2-7 is all the score. 2-7 to 12 points. The next day against Donegal, they kick 12 points. And then against Dublin, they kick eight. Now, I know weather conditions are a factor here. I know Tyrone have won the All-Ireland, had their team holiday. They were back a bit later than others. Would you anticipate seeing the same reaction and mentality next weekend against Mayo? They're at home again in Healy Park. They're playing Mayo. Mayo who are buzzing, who were in such good form the last day. Would you anticipate seeing the same reaction, same change in mentality next weekend from Tyrone that you saw in Dublin this time? Well, you'd hope so for Tyrone's sake because they need to do something. They need a change in something. As you said, they're not going well up front. A lot of their scores are coming from midfield. You know, even the Fitzpatrick's goal. There was Patrick, yeah. low, he seems to be he seems to be getting in for those goal chances instead of the inside forwards. You know, McCurry is not himself yet. McShane doesn't seem as sharp yet. But I think that a lot of Tyrone fellas individually have a lot of scope to improve. Whereas, I, like I don't think, I don't think they have a, a team problem. I think that they're just they have a serious hangover. A flat. They're flat. But Say it again, James. So a serious flat. what? They have a serious hangover. I like Jimmy on a Monday, like normally. <laughs> but um, but you know, it's funny you say. If you look at their key players last year. Player of the year, Kieran McGeary, has not. He, he's, he's had not a quiet league campaign. But he, he can. He has three gears to go. He'll improve. Yeah, way more out of him. Myler as well, one of their standout yeah. players, been really quiet. Hampshire's had a couple of issues, obviously, with the sentence off. He hasn't been getting forward as much. So, like, there's just a flatness around for it. It's not really a tactical thing. Like, I say, McCurry 
Like he gets the goal against a brilliant goal against Kildare, but he, he hasn't been getting the scores. So you remember last year in the National League, he was scored a week nearly every week. Dazzler. There was a, there was a bounce in, in Tyrone. They have not had that yet. I thought their best performance was the first half against Donegal, where I was impressed with them, but a really yes. flat second half, really bad first half against Armagh, where they're blown out of the water, and then the same again at the weekend. And they're going. They need to turn it around against Mayo. They yep. do. They need a spark from somewhere. They really do. And I think we'll, we'll, let's talk more about Tyrone next week, lads. Let's get more in depth in Tyrone next week. Go again, James. Just leave me one thing on Tyrone. Yeah. And we always say this. Their thing is getting to that intensity yeah. for a once-off game three times in the year, maybe, or four times. National League, is it their be all and all? No. They don't want to go down, fair enough. But like when they zone in on a team for a week or two and have that absolute drive to beat that one team, I think they have that X factor then to go a step above. Well, that's where boys like McGeary and Myler come to the fore. Yeah. That's where you see them. That's when they reach their gear. They're massive players. They wouldn't have won the all Ireland without those guys in the form they were in. And they have not got to the pitch of it yet. Yeah. That's fair enough. Whatever reasons behind that if they haven't done no training or whatever it is but there's no denying it that their key players are not at the levels that they were in winning the All-Ireland last year Sludden as well McKeon and they've had a couple of things which have gone against them like you say that the, the settings off and the team's getting on their back as well yeah it's been a tough five games in the National League for them and, and Sunday was as probably as poor as they've been uh, to, to date as well so one thing it's a kicking that backside for Tyrone. And the other thing, I wouldn't get overly carried away with Dublin. They were still... Yeah, they were old. still fallible. If that goal goes in before half yeah. time, you know... Like said, that's the third quarter for them. So while it was positive for Dublin, obviously the first half performance and getting back on the road and, and showing signs of, of what we expect from them at their best. Yeah. Opposition was, was pretty poor from Tyrone. But um, we'll see. Big weekend for both counties again this weekend. Tyrone need to get a win and Dublin need to get a win. So what we have next weekend is Tyrone up against Mayo. Tyrone need a win to stay up and keep themselves in contention of staying up. Mayo need a win to get into the league final or stay in the mix for the league final. Armagh are facing Kerry in the athletic grounds. That's going to be a box office clash. Yeah. Kildare are playing Monaghan. You'd imagine it's probably winner takes all there for who stays up. And Dublin are hosting Donegal and Crow Park. So that's a tough task for Donegal who haven't got motoring at all. Monaghan, James, you got to hand it to them. Like, if they manage to stay up again in Division 1, they're, like, Mon and Amid played a Division 3 league final, I'd say, nearly nine years ago, 2014, I think, 2015, maybe. They were down in Division 3. Mon and have got up to Division 1 and have stayed there. It's incredible. Like, and you see, like, talk about a county maxing out their resources. <laughs> Anthony now has Donny Buckley and Liam Sheedy to name just two working with him on the sideline. Liam <laughs> Sheedy in with him. Liam oh, Sheedy's in as performance coach he? with Monaghan. Yeah. He's, he's, he's a performance that. coach. He's in on some capacity anyways, but he's got Sheedy and Buckley. We spoke in depth about Keane O'Neill last week. Donny Buckley is somebody who's obviously be bringing something to that Monaghan dressing room as well. Yeah, definitely. Donny, Donny will be taking all the football sessions, I'd imagine. Like okay. he'll want to have a big hand in a lot of things. Um, he's very good on kickouts. Very good defensively. Very good at tackling as a forward unit as well. So Monaghan, Monaghan are actually almost a perfect team for him because they have so much scope there for improvement as well. There are probably some areas they didn't probably focus on as much that he will bring. He'll bring that level of, of knowledge and experience. Um, but they've had they've had a, a, a good year already. But yeah. they need to they need to have that bounce as well. The thing with Monaghan is. Can they have that zone in mentality to rattle in Ulster? Because we said that if they can, if whoever comes out of Ulster has a great chance, a great chance to go all the way. Yeah, so, I back, I back Monaghan to do that. Like I, back I, 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 I've, I've, I'm impressed with that. Like they're so. I don't think they're. I don't think they're top Ulster team though. I don't. Think no, they're, no, they're, they're not. But would you be surprised if they won the Ulster championship? No, I wouldn't. They were oh, oh, oh. win the All Ireland a couple of weeks ago. They're what? 40. 40 to 1. But if you look, I was watching like the last quarter yesterday where they're in the mix and Murphy's back on for Donegal. The crowd are getting involved. You think, yeah. 
and Donny Gall get momentum behind him, and, and Monaghan are bringing on Fintan Kelly and these these boys, and Kieran Duffy kicking same scores. old soldiers. Yeah, it's like these guys. I remember playing them my debut, and these guys were playing years ago. They're probably established when you were playing. Monaghan, yeah, debut. it's like the the player pool Monaghan have is so small, but these guys are going to the wheel. They give nothing away easy. They're just yeah. organised. They make you fight for everything. They've got a great goalkeeper. They've got one of the best forwards in the game. And then you've got guys like Conor McCarthy, Jack McCarron. These guys popping in with scores as well. They're just they're, they're hard to play against. They'll give you nothing. Banty will have them as organised as any team that's there. I'm not surprised with it. That, that they, they see off Donegal, they win the game comfortably in the end. They'll probably stay in Division 1. They probably, by the skin of their teeth last year, they outsmart Galway going down the stretch and managed to stay in Division 1. They nearly go on and win the Ulster Championship. Like they're yeah. so close to beating Throne that they are a team for over a decade, no matter who was in charge, they get the absolute maximum out of the players they have. And this year again, they're, they're, they're doing the same again. Like, you, if they were a little bit more clinical, they probably should beat Mayo and Clonus. That's yep. always been a challenge for them. But I'm, I'm not surprised that they'll probably stay in Division 1, and I wouldn't be surprised that they would be there right in the mix. Are they as exciting as an Armagh or a Derry or newer, these newer teams on the block? Probably not, but they're like an old war horse. They, yeah. will, be in, they will be in the mix. And Maybe just to in. confirm, Liam Sheedy is performance coach of Monaghan this year. So like, it's such an impressive ticket that Banty has put together there with himself, Buckley. And Sheedy, like they must be getting. You're talking about the same players being there, the old war horses. They have to be getting a kick out of Buckley and Sheedy going in and renewing and refreshing things. Well, I was so, expecting Paul Finley and Tommy Freeman to be coming on at the weekend. Like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, these lads are on the go. The boys probably boys. could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, I thought they managed so, that game really well and, and just closed well, it out. That's experience. Newbridge, Newbridge, like it was hopping for Dublin, Dublin Kildare. It's going to be hopping for Monaghan. Kildare this weekend as well because uh, as we said both teams need a win to secure their place probably even technically not even secure their place but be with a chance of staying up in yeah. Division 1 Sammy, as good as Monaghan are and were mm-hmm. Donegal are in serious trouble well like, can I park you on that James mean, because can I, park you on, can I park you on Donegal because I think we're going to be able to have the same conversation about Donegal next week on the Hover Pod they're playing Dublin in Crow Park one on it right they no, no, like if you want to get to bed tonight, Paddy, don't get started. Diabolical on the in the first half against Strong. <laughs> they turn it around the second half. They get a massive kick and they go, right, is this the spark? Murphy's back in playing as well. And then they're so flat again against Monaghan. They could have played that match for another two hours. They weren't gonna, they weren't gonna turn it around. No. They go it's to big... Co Park at the weekend. Yeah. It's a tough game for them. It's probably a great game for Dublin on the back of, of, of their win in Alma. I'm sure, like I said, we'll probably cover it more in detail um, on next week's podcast. Yes, we will, because I, I interrupted James and I stopped James from talking about Donegal. So, James, I promise you next week, first question on the football pod, and Paddy, you can hold me to this. You can tell me what you think of Donegal. Right. Okay, sorry for that. <laughs> I'm in New York, so, Jimmy, you take the lead on next week's pod, right? Oh, yeah, he's in New York this weekend. There you go. Oh. Yeah, he'll be back for Monday, don't worry. Division two, lads. Um, Paddy, you must have been happy. Like, it's been a long time without a win for this county. Um, finally, they pull it out of the bag. Mead in Navin put up 118 on the board. The hammer cork. But I'm yeah. not sure we should be talking about Mead here. Things are pretty bad in Cork, James. Cork are in serious trouble. <laughs> they are, a I'm rueful just, shake of the head with a little grin. <laughs> no, I honestly, if there's yeah. one team I want to see going well, it's Cork. Just for Kerry Cork, Munster Games, they are unbelievable down here. Yeah. Like Kerry Cork and Killarney is a day for the calendar. It's just a great occasion. And it's so sad to see that there's no gallop out of him. And Keith Rickon, like, I don't know. He seems to, he's gone in there. He's tried to kind of get the culture going rather than the football going, you know, he's trying to get the right people in with him, the right players who are going to take him forward. But oh, when they're losing games as badly as they are, it's only going to go from bad to worse. And in the Munster Championship, they're going to get beaten. They're going to get beaten early. And when the Cork crowd turn against them, they turn so harsh. So, <laughs> Really? Oh, 
uh, the, that they will be eaten up and sped out by the car crowd if they do don't they, get back together. Do they not just turn back to the hurlers? Do they, they not just banish them? Nearly indifference, which is that's forget about them. Worse. That's worse. That's yeah. like saying I'm not angry, I'm disappointed, kind of thing. <laughs> sorry, when you say when you say Cork, sorry, just to clarify. Without the end of a few, would have my time. <laughs> just to clarify, when you say Cork are going to be put out of Munster early, you mean Cork are going to lose the Munster semi final to Kerry? Oh, they're definitely I, going to be out of Munster look, early, yeah. But even if they drew Tip, Claire, or Kerry, they, they'd probably lose. Limerick have backed themselves. I know they had a blip at the weekend, but Limerick will back themselves against Cork and Munster yeah. next week. You're looking Cork for have. you're looking for a, any signs from going well, anything to cling to and go. Okay, results haven't been going great, but there's a couple of things we're working on. There, there is none of that we're seeing with Cork, and we I remember our very first part of the year we're going right. Who do we hope gets a bit of a run? We're looking at Galway. Yeah, we're looking at Kildare in Division One. Can our man keep it going? Derry. Can Cork get something going? These big traditional, like Mead and Cork, 80s, 90s, they're absolute powerhouses of it. And they've both fallen so far. But Mead, at least there's sparks with Mead and they're underage when Andy McAdee's doing a big win for them to kind of at least kickstart their season and give them a chance to stay in Division 2. But if you're Cork coming out and having there at the weekend, like well beaten, yeah. like wiped out. Yeah. Where do you go from there? What's the positive thing over the first three months of the season that Keith Rickon can can fall back on? Like the, the one positive the Cork the have, the, like, the one positive, the one positive the Cork have lads is that Cork are facing down next in Parky Cueve, and then they've awfully in their final game. So Cork can conceivably stay up. They're playing the teams against them in this relegation battle. Mead are on four points, and they're on the same amount of points as Clare. They both of those teams, I feel, still need a, a point to stay up for sure. Um, they'll probably be okay on four points, but but to be to be guaranteed survival, you probably need another point there. Mead are playing Clare next in Cusick Park. They have a decent record against Clare over the last couple of years. Then Mead have Derry. Um, like who knows whether Derry will be already promoted by that stage, you know. Um, so Cork, the one thing going in Cork's favor, now they've had they've lost powder, they've lost meat into injury. Um, they've got if, the same boys. If Brian Hurley was to get injured, Tommy. Oh my god. They wouldn't score more than more than seven points. And like Stephen Sherlock is 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 a very good forward, is kicking kicking points. Um Blake Murphy has, has scored a few, but like Hurley is their talisman. Hurley is the danger man up there. Yes, and he's playing well. He's kicking some brilliant scores. And he is he is leading up there. Yeah. But they're just so short. They're the, so short. Um, they don't have any plan of attack. Yeah. Yeah, and even defensively, like me, we know how me have played football for the last five years under Andy McEntee. Under Andy McEntee, they run at you, and they run at p- speed, and they were able to open up, cut open Cork so many times at the weekend watching that game. You know, so standing, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he was savage. He's got a he's got a lovely turn, lovely cut, doesn't he? Um, and Jordan Morris is looking good at the weekend as well. I'm not going to talk Mead up too much here. Um, we're going to move on. You said uh, Mead for Sam before we came on. I did not. <laughs> You did. Oh, don't you dare say that. I'll be wearing my. Uh, I'll be wearing my half and half jersey this weekend. I'll have you know Claire and Mead uh, in Ennis this Sunday, so I'll, I'll send it on to you afterwards. Uh, moving on briefly, lads. I have a question in uh, on the Football Pod Instagram account. Um, whoever wants to take this, jump in. I set the scene. Antrim are playing Cavan in the Ulster Championship this year. Antrim have a home game. It's due to be in Corrigan Park. Paddy Andrews, it sounds like you want to jump in here. Calvin have said... Play in Corrigan Park. Come on. Mm, there's no argument, is there? Do you think? But, I mean, why Why would they why possibly not? want to move it? Now, not to lead the witness here, but I think it absolutely should be played in Corrigan Park. But what people are saying is that Calvin fans are hungry to go to a championship game. There should be... No way. The game should be in Corrigan Park. That's the way the draw was done. Get on with it. This is worse than the expenses carry on with. Just, just honor it. No, yeah, the draw is the draw. You can't just say, Oh, we'll play them, but we'll play them in neutral venue. Why I'd have to say, lads, there has been precedence in Leinster where the dubs were coming to town and games were moved to maybe a more park or somewhere neutral that it might be able to house a, a bigger crowd. Like there there is precedence there in, in, in other games. Like Paddy, I'd say you've had you had games moved and I would say even the counties agreed to move them. The the home county would have agreed to move them because the news yeah. would have got a big a big kick out of the dubs coming yeah. to town and, exactly. and a big ticket. Antrim aren't in that bracket. They don't want to move it. Antrim so. don't want it. Antrim are buzzing. Antrim are top of there division three. 
I'd say Cavan in Division 4 see them as a danger uh, and there has to be an element of that. I was surprised that the other counties didn't back them. Um, only two counties backed them in the vote last week, so we'll see what happens. Hopefully next week that's all settled, but that game should be in Corrigan Park. Antrim GA fans are up in arms about it at the minute. A lot of Cavan fans are saying... I Antrim GA fans of Belfast over the weekend. Did you? Did you enjoy yeah, Belfast? Did you have a good time? I did. I thought it was great. Big fans of the pod. Bumped into a few Derry legends as well. Um, Talk to me. Who'd you bump into? Uh, through the 93 team and oh, lovely. Me and these guys now yeah so right. I have to say uh, I was called over didn't know geez, I'm in trouble here a Dublin accent but uh, <laughs> they're welcoming me over it was great to see the class some, of 93 yeah some great legends there all Ireland winners um, and yes fans of the pod up in Belfast there you are now that's great so I, I definitely support Antrim there and the McGillie's doing an amazing job they've had savage progress the draw is the draw played in Corrigan Park mm. And, and let's see how that one goes. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully that gets settled and sorted. And for the Cavan fans who don't make it, hopefully you'll make the next game, whether how it be in the Ulster Championship. How many fans the Cavan think they're going to bring? I'd say they reckon they'll bring 10,000, but you'll only get three into Corrigan Park. As you said, though, lads, like people want to go to games right now, and I can understand that. People are mad to go to games, but just stick it up in a streaming service or something. That is like, that is the big issue we have at the minute. We have an email in that I'm going to read out next week. Um, it's a from, fixed case from park that should, would have avoided this problem altogether wouldn't yeah. it that, that is the big issue so just yeah. to run through next week's games in Division 2 it's Cork down relegation playoff Derry are facing Galway Paddy that's the game you've been crying out for but you're going to be in New York so we'll send you clips don't worry we'll have you up to speed for on Monday morning <laughs> is that Saturday or Sunday that is on Sunday in Owen Beg. Claire Mead and Q's Q- Park on Sunday late. I watched all the games in Prague now, so you have to watch all the games. <laughs> you, <laughs> you did, did all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, you did, yeah. <laughs> rel, rel, in Division 3, just to run through the fixtures this weekend, lads, I know we're, we're nearly finished here in Episode 8 of the Football Pod. Longford Wicklow is a relegation playoff. Louder playing Antrim, top of the table. But Westmead and Fermanagh, I think they're in the mix um, in Division 3 as well for that promotion spot, so they'll be fighting for that. And then in Division 4, Kavanagh in London. Waterford are playing Sligo. Leitrim are playing Wexford. And Tipperary are playing Carlo. I know I'm missing one game in Division 3, but it's not on my sheet for some reason. So Where's that? The Antrim Loud game? That is in RD. Whoever wins that more or less is promoted, I would say, is it? Judging by that table. Whoever wins that more or less is promoted. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Leach and Limerick is the other game uh, on Saturday night in Division 3. So we're, we're nearly finished. A couple of little bits of house business to get to. Um, James... How do you think your fancy football team got on this weekend? I'm on the up, according to the boys' tweet, but I, I could be wrong. I, I think I had Shawnee, and he dislocated his toe, so that was my yeah. main scoring threat gone. Yeah. How did I get on? Did I plummet? No, I'm just looking for your team here now. You didn't plummet. All I, I think have to do is finish ahead of Paddy, and it's a win. Well, I, I still think... have Conor Callaghan as captain. <laughs> <laughs> Was that your little look there, was it, when you threw your eyes to heaven? Oh, fantasy football. Jesus Christ. Every week we forget, Paddy. I've clucks to the goal and can up front. <laughs> yeah, James O'Donoghue is streaked ahead here. 31st position in our overall league. He's uh, 171 points last week. I'm back in 58, 151. And Paddy's propping up the table on 91, 91st position. Well, I'm going to pick one week. I'm going to give this attention. In fairness to you, Paddy. I guarantee I'll wipe the floor. Can, can I just say something here? You got more points than me last week. There you go. So just you're, you're actually, alone. if you just pull the finger out, you know, you'd be there. Yeah. Kevin Ford is still leading our table. So Kevin, you're going to be in the mix for one of our fantasy Gaelic prizes. We have some good prizes coming your way. I actually haven't opened it yet, but uh, Evan Talty of IGA coach sent us in uh, one of the, the coaching tablets as well. So that's a, uh, thanks yeah. to Kevin for that. And IGA Definitely coach, check that out. Tommy, and I'll do it sitting in the yeah. early lounge and JFK. I'll have a few minutes to myself. We, we will look at that this weekend, Paddy, and I'll get that over to you. So You've, that's uh, pretty Kim much Kardashian's it. Kardashian's book behind you as well there, Tommy, can be a prize. Whose book? Kim Kardashian's. <laughs> I <laughs> absolutely. I, swear I, didn't buy I, do, I do not. <laughs> you do? I spotted it there on the bottom. <laughs> He's rumbled. I have Paris <laughs> Hilton as well. I have Seamus Callanan. <laughs> Is that what you're looking at? I have Roy Keane, Tiger Woods, Andre Agassi. He's throwing Keane in there just to try and bulk it up a bit. Yeah. Nice. No, it's, it's a good Tiger it. Woods book, I must say. I read it myself. Yeah. You good the, the, the two fellas wrote. Yeah. Have you read yes. it? Yeah. Savage. Very good. A lot of have people you... told about, which was a bit harsh. Yeah. Have you read the Brian Clough book, provided you don't kiss me? No. No. That's a cracker. I'd say he has some stories. 
Yeah. Andrea Agassi Open, surely you vote right that. Yeah, yeah. It's not yeah. as good as King Kardashian's, but it's very good. <laughs> <laughs> He's going through them all individually now to prove they okay. don't have Kim Kardashian. Like, Tommy, your it, could have, it could have been We've there. We've been on this podcast for three hours. He said just keep it down to 10 o'clock tonight. <laughs> okay. That is episode eight of the Football Pod with Paddy Anders and James O'Donoghue. As always, lads, you've gone above and beyond. Thank you very much for your time this week. Thank you very much. Jacks are back. The dubs are back. The Jacks are back, baby. The Jacks are back. <laughs> there you go, James. We'll see, I fancy Donegal next week. <laughs> <laughs> Boys, thanks very you much. We'll see you next favorites week. for the All Ireland anyway, which is the main. Well, he's done no, it. That's no, getting no, clipped. No, no, he's no, going no. straight up. Cork we're again. hammering beaten. everyone, and we're missing all our players. That is top class, Jimmy. Did you learn nothing in your media days? No. <laughs> no, I'll agree with Dermot. Dear McConnelly, Mayo. Mayo's year. That was Dermo said. Yeah. We so might come back to that. Cheers, boys. Good night, lads. Well played. Magic. <laughs>